Attention, due to the nature of the films discussed, the Civil Gore podcast may contain adult language and themes. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to episode 95 of the Civil Gore podcast. I am your host, Tim. And this is your other host, Brian. And we're back, Tim, to our regular format. Yes, it seems like it's been forever. It does. It does. But it was good to get back to watching a movie, uh, especially one of the, the our, from our iconic list that we hadn't covered yet. Because, I mean, granted, we know we loved talking about prepping for the con and recapping for the con, but it, it's kind of good to get back, get back to our roots, you know, what makes Civil Gore Civil Gore. That's right. And I had not seen this movie in quite some time. This is one of my favorites, but I just, you know, it's not one that I watch a lot. So it was kind of fun to go back and revisit it after a few years. Yeah, I hadn't seen it in a while, but yeah, it's well actually I think it was on cable about a year ago and I caught like the second half of it. But I used to watch this I mean we'll get into more of this of course during the, the meat of the discussion, but I, I used to watch this literally weekly at one point. I was obsessed with this movie. I loved it. It's definitely <laughs> one of my favorite horror movies of all time. And it's funny to have a remake of such a classic film just be so powerful on its own but we'll get into all that uh coming up because of course you know we have our you you know we we can't forget we have a whole order when we do a real show now that's right yeah first we have to get into our first chop (laughs) all right brian so i was trying to squeeze in my 40 years of terror project because i had a eventful weekend i went and ran a spartan sprint race in charlotte which was my first one I've ever done, and it was insane. It was mud about five or six inches deep the whole course. Wow. See, I didn't realize that until you showed me the picture. I didn't realize it was like one of those tough mudder type things. Yeah, and it was a blast because I've been taking uh, Spartan training classes uh, through my employee gym for the past three months or so. And this was the first race I had the opportunity to run in, and it was so much fun. And it's a it's a team-based uh, event when we do it. So everybody helps each other over the obstacles. Nobody's left on their own. So in that respect, it wasn't as physically demanding as you might think. It's still very physically demanding, but you have some help when it comes to like the tougher stuff to, we, we can always work as a team to get over it. And I thought that was a lot of fun and had a blast, man. I got totally, totally, that's the most muddy I've ever been in my life, I think. Yeah. But uh, it was definitely fun. I'd do it again. See, I wish I could say that too, but like pretty much any running thing would be um, that I'd end up that way because I'd probably trip and fall at some point (laughs) regardless. But, you know, now that you've done this, uh, Tim, you you have something in common with Jason Voorhees. You both have tough mutters. (laughs) <laughs> that's right <laughs> oh i'm back ah, he's back baby back with he's the back puns. baby yeah <laughs> but it was it was a blast we had a ton of fun i'll have to post a picture on instagram or something for uh for you guys to show how yes. dirty i was because i got to see it i got to see dirty tim yeah <laughs> it was... you all sh- you all should see dirty tim also yeah uh so the uh, roulette wheel came up with 2000, the year Whoa. 2000. And that was a uh, kind of interesting year for horror movies because if you look up horror movies from the year 2000, it was such a mixed bag. You had some classics like Final Destination. You had Ginger oh, Snaps. Yeah, yeah. You had American Psycho. You had Scream 3. And then you had stuff like, uh, let's see, uh, Hollow Man and... Dracula 2000. Yeah, I was going to say, there's and a myriad of movies that have 2000 in the title. Too. Yeah, <laughs> and so it was kind of funny that you had like some some real classics hit that year, but also some real duds. Uh, Leprechaun in the Hood. <laughs> so yeah, uh, but uh, not the Lyndon Porco. Uh, no, no, this was no, Warwick he's Davis. Brought it back. This is the old Warwick Davis. But uh, not to take anything away from Warwick Davis, who's also fantastic. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, but uh, we'll get to Leprechaun in one of our future slaycations, I'm sure. Yeah, we might, maybe we should like almost make target that for this summer because now the new one will be uh, the most latest one will be actually out on Blu-ray by then. So I think we that, should. I think that'd I think be we fun. Should, yeah, especially you know, in, in honor of our newfound friendship, as Tim and I look at it, and just other con guests to Lyndon Porco. But, yeah, <laughs> but but I figured we should we should, we should do that series anyway because it, it's it's it was such a good series and it's out of horror icons go. It's one we have you know really haven't done much on yet so plus i don't think i've ever seen anything past leprechaun 2 honestly 
I uh, want to say I think I've seen. I remember the first three, and then from that point, I'm not sure what I saw. <laughs> So, so uh, but uh, this year was kind of tough for me because I've seen most of these movies, but I ran across one and it intrigued me because it said it was a Toby Hooper film. And I was like, what? And it was called Crocodile. Uh, so, yes, yes. Toby Hooper. This. Yeah, he made another alligator film after eating alive called uh, Crocodile. And this one is a movie that you've seen before, even if you have never seen it before. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. It is, it is a very by the numbers giant animal movie. You have a bunch of kids that go on spring break to a lake and they have a suspicious town sheriff who knows that they're up to no good. And yeah. you have a giant crocodile that stalks them and eats them one by one. So uh, in that respect, it was pretty bland, uh, but mm. it is Toby Hooper. So you have a really good director directing a pretty stereotypical movie, and that makes it at least a notch above what this would have been in the hands of any other director. So I will That's say uh, I wasn't bored by it. Uh, it was nothing to write home about, but uh, it was entertaining enough for a giant crocodile movie. And the crocodile was pretty cool. So, uh, Yeah, and I was going to say, what you got to do is add Betty White, and then you get Lake Placid. But, yeah, um, <laughs> exactly. But, but also, it, it, going back to the, the Toby Hooper element of it, if you want to hear uh, one of our early reviews of a movie, I think episode three we did, Eaten Alive. And so that was when... Uh, Civil Gore was definitely leaning towards the uh, the comedic uh, slants on all the movies that we've done, <laughs> you know, yeah. right after the Manitou episode. So we we're kind of going for that kind of movie where we could just talk about it and kind of kind of make it very comedic at the same time. But now yeah. now I think we have the perfect blend. You know, we do like good, like like hard hitting criticisms and critiques, and but also add our comedy to it. Yeah, those were the uh, the golden years of Civil Gore. That doesn't mean they were better. That just means they're old. No, they were just old. Yeah, just old. <laughs> yeah, ironically, Tim and I were younger. Go figure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Brian. So your Twilight Zone project continues. And I saw a couple of, of these on here that I really remember fondly. Yeah, there, there's, some, there's some doozies on here that were um, a couple of uh, iconic ones and a couple of just really good ones. So first one was uh, Back There. And this one was uh, – this one actually started the professor from uh, Gilligan's Island uh, – uh, and it's, it was a, a, a he really prominent... gets around, doesn't he? He does because he was in that <laughs> other one too. So he's all over the place. Uh, only if he had this kind of uh, this kind of power in Gilligan's Island, they, they might have got out of there pretty quick. But um, so basically, it's a, at a prominent club in Washington D.C. A socialite argues about whether it would be possible to change history by traveling back in time. When he leaves the club, he finds himself in 1865 and the night that President Lincoln will be shot. This one I really liked. I mean, it's it's this type of story has been done so many times where yeah of course with the time travel element and can you change history this one did it like in a really cool way though i thought because there was really no like explanation why he traveled back there was no uh you know reason why he was particularly attached to this particular moment in time it just seemed to happen it was just really just a cool thing and you know it's like you know it's one of those things where you know you, you see the time travel you, you know you discuss that and you get a, like a major headache kind of a yeah. thing you know when you're trying to figure out stuff but <laughs> this one I thought was done well pretty quick had a nice little like twist to it and I just thought it was a really well done version of that same story which we've seen I mean tons of times but it was really stood out though uh, the next one was the whole truth a used car salesman buys a car that dooms him to tell only the truth this one was okay. I mean, it was very predictable. Um, kind of yeah. had a little horror element because apparently the car was haunted. But I mean, it was it was, it was fine. It was I it's, I like to we'll use our Tim and I's term when we just kind of like to say it was okay. You know, it's like yeah, it was like it's a fine. early version of liar liar. I guess. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> essentially exactly what it was. It was like it, but like not as comedic with yeah. out Jim Carrey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next one was, of course, one of the most famous episodes. Classic, Ag classic Ag yeah. yeah, Agnes Moorhead stars in The Invaders. Um, and that's when a woman investigates a clamor on the roof of her rural house. She discovers a small UFO and little aliens emerging from it. 
or so it seems. And this one I just love at the classic because the little aliens are basically like those wind-up robots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the effects were definitely uh, very basic at the time, but of course that is the classic twist ending. Um, and you've you've probably this one if they this used to be and I remember uh, I, I think I had mentioned before Channel Eleven used to do their Twilight Zone nights, and this was always one of the four that they did when they did their classic ones because this was just super super iconic. Uh, the next one was a penny for your thoughts. It says, gaining telepathic abilities when his coin lands on, on on its edge, bank clerk Hector B. Poole learns about the differences between other people's plans and fantasies. And this one was kind of a cool because it like it, when it looked like it twisted into a really like tragic ending, it twisted towards a happy ending. And it starred uh, one of the uh, – Darren's from Bewitched. I don't remember which one. <laughs> <laughs> I get so confused. Old Darren Dick, or new Darren. Old Darren. It was or Dick new York Darren. or Dick Sargent. I don't remember. I'm not going to try. But yeah, uh, so that was a really good one. Uh, 22. It says while in the hospital recovering from overwork, Liz Powell keeps dreaming about going down to the hospital morgue. And this one was interesting because this one is a story that, like, it's one of those. It was almost like a precursor to Final Destination at some level, because she keeps imagining going down into uh, this this hospital ward. But it turns out that later on, it's it was maybe a premonition she had about not getting on board a flight, which and then crashes. And I remember my uh, this goes back. My dad used to tell me this story. Of he used to have this dream, this recurring dream where he would get he would be going on boarding a flight. Um, and it was like the sky was like this certain way and he would get on the plane and the plane would crash. And he used to tell me over and over again that like every, anytime he had to fly anywhere, he'd look to see and make sure it wasn't like that. And one time it actually ended up being the same way in his dream, but obviously he's fine. But so it was just a coincidence, but like super creepy, but yeah. So like anything like that kind of reminded me of that right away. And also of course, final destination. And the final one, another flight one actually, is the Odyssey of Flight 33. Passing through the sound barrier, a commercial airliner inadvertently travels back in time. And I don't know if you saw this one. I've seen this one a number of times. I kind of like this one. This one's just yeah. a cool little sci-fi time travel one that like actually has one of the few like kind of open-ending Twilight Zones where you don't know if it's going to turn out positive or negative or what's going to happen But because uh, it kind of ends with them attempting one more chance to get back uh, to where they started. So it was pretty cool. I like that one. Yeah, a perfect segue into Jordan Peele's Twilight Zone, which I think we both got a chance to see. Yes. Uh, two episodes have been released so far, I believe. Uh, the first one was The Comedian. That one, I have to say, I was actually disappointed in the first episode. Not that it was terrible, but it dragged a little for me. Uh, and maybe it's because I don't like watching fake stand-up comedy. <laughs> like when yeah. It's, when well, you're especially watching when it's, when it's, it's a bad, bad yeah. one. Yeah, I like exactly. that though. Well regulated. He kept saying that like a hundred times, and you oh, knew his bits. God. And, yeah, yeah it was I mean, I, I like the. I watched it with Julie actually, and of course she like, you know, we both like kind of predicted what was going to happen. Um, it. We, yeah, here's the thing. It wasn't a bad episode. I think though to relaunch the series, it may not have been the best choice to start the series. Right. Yeah, I think exactly. there should have been a way more powerful episode. To begin, like, really, like, begin with a, a bang, you know, something strong. I will say, though, Jordan Peele, does he nail the Rod Serling opening type things? I love his opening for it. Yeah. And I love the opening credits. And if you notice when the logo turns, you know, it says Twilight Zone, it almost seems to be the – like, it's almost like the font goes from all the uh, – the original to the remake to the from the eighties to the two thousand one to this one it's like it has it's like almost bl has a weird blend to it it's very reminiscent of all the logos which I thought was cool I mean it's all they were all similar anyway but there was just something about it it was cool and yeah. I thought he he did a great job with his, his uh, narrations yeah now the second episode I enjoyed a lot that one was uh, an update of Nightmare at Thirty Thousand Feet and right. I thought they did an awesome job making that different from anything we've seen before because we've seen that in the yeah. classic we saw it in the twilight zone the movies we've seen i mean it would have been kind of uh i don't say dumb it had been kind of redundant to do that again exactly the same way just with updated effects so i thought it was really neat how they kind of modernized that tale yeah they, and they made it relevant to today's like society and it, you know and basically they replaced the the gremlin aspect with 
like humanity is the the, the gremlin essentially. Right. Yeah, know? it was really cool. I didn't add. Uh, oh God, I'm drawing a blank on his name. Adam Scott. Adam Scott. Yeah, yeah, he was fantastic in it. Uh, so I really, I really like that episode. Now I think that should have been the first. I agree. Episode. I see why they didn't, though. They probably did not want to start with one that, you know, just a remake of an original right, episode. Yeah. But again, it's like, I think I would have, you're right, I would have preferred that one to start off then. Because remember, there are people that are not familiar with the Twilight Zone. They've heard about it. They know the gist of it, but they probably haven't seen many episodes. So it still could have probably been fresh to a number of audience uh, audience members. So I think, yeah, I, I mean, if I was me, I would have chose that one out of the two. I mean, we don't know what's coming yet. So, I mean, we could find that there was a way better one they should have started off with. But it was yeah. hard. I mean, I guess it was hard to choose. And the fact that the way, you know, it's on a streaming service that may not be one of the more popular ones. Uh, I mean, this may make it one. But, yeah, it was, it, was, it was probably a tough choice. But, I mean, neither one was bad by any means. They're both – I enjoyed both of them. It's just you're right. The first one had a little bit of a, a drag element to it. I will say there was a really – the ambiance of it, though, was creepy. Like, it seemed like it was, like, nothing – like, the whole time something seemed off, which – so I guess the, 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 the way it was portrayed was kind of cool. Yeah. So uh, next up, we have some bad news for Fangoria subscribers because a lot of people's issues three are arriving damaged. I know yours did, Brian. Yeah, mine was uh, – the, the package was bad, and so I said, okay, well, I don't mind the package outside of it being bad as long as it's okay. And it looked okay at first, and then I noticed that the uh, spine was – had a literally a tear in it. Like someone tried to tear it apart. So I immediately contacted them. They got back to me within like two hours or less and said they would they, – you basically just have to give them your uh, your order number – for their subscription, and they'll resend you one. So they, they're, I mean, their customer service is, is on it already. They are well aware of the problem, and they already said they're kind of addressing. Um, I saw, I so said they tweet someone actually how they're addressing the uh, packaging for issue four. So cool. So next up, we caught the uh, the next week of the last drive, and of course, Joe Bob opened with Chud, and we got to catch that one a little earlier on. But then most recently, he did Q, the Winged Serpent, and Society. And I got to catch both of those. Actually, Q, yeah. I caught live. Uh, I had to turn it off about halfway through Society. But uh, that was a lot of fun. It took me back to the old Monster Vision days, staying up and watching old Joe Bob live. Oh, my God. It was so much fun, especially with the live tweeting. And, and it, was, it was so involved that they basically Twitter booted Darcy the Mail Girl, the 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 – the, the nerve of them because they I guess they assumed she was a bot she was tweeting so much back and forth with everybody. That's great. So we not only broke the internet when Joe Bob first premiered on Shutter. Now yeah. we've broken Twitter. <laughs> right, but we got her out. Did. We got her out of Twitter jail. We we all <laughs> we all everyone was started tweeting at Twitter. Uh, you know, back at Twitter's assistant, she was trying to get it released, and they actually resolved it pr- pretty quickly. I have to say, I think within like a half hour, she was back, and and she you know she's such an important part of that show. Uh, when she with the social media aspect now, because that's something you did not get in that same way with Monster Vision. I mean, I know Tim had mentioned his, his Usenet groups or whatever he did, right? What right. was it, Usenet? Like a, a Merc? we did a Merc chat. Merc? Yeah. It was Merc, yeah. And so, yeah, so it like, you know, Tim had that, but this was like, this is like a, like a whole new kind of audience you get. I mean, you literally have, and she is, key, she tries to keep up with everyone. We got one uh, tweet through that got retweeted, but you know, she probably gets like seriously hundreds of tweets simultaneously. Yeah. And she does a great job of, of replying and retweeting. And so, so yeah, and, you know, hands, hats off to you, Darcy, because you, uh, <laughs> you, you know, it, Joe Bob's doing his thing and you're doing your thing. And it, it like makes for just a great, like, I mean, it was like over four and a half hours, I think. Of, yeah. of entertainment i i sat through the whole thing i was i was just it was so much fun because just you know getting watching the movies and then seeing you know seeing the reaction on the social media getting uh joe bob's interstitials stitchels and his his first his cue uh driving totals was had me on the floor oh yeah hysterical. that was one of the best ever yeah <laughs> yeah it was one of the best ever so yeah if it's coming the next friday uh he's gonna do it again nine o'clock on shutter live so make sure you can uh you know, you guys tune in if you're available because it it's just not the same when you watch it on replay. You gotta watch it live and live and have your Twitter, you know, have your phone charged or your iPad charged, so you're on Twitter and you could just see all the the fun that goes on. We should do a uh, if we can schedule it far enough in advance. Try to do one like where we hop on there and 
I'll oh, just do a yeah. big old Twitter session with everybody as we're watching oh, it yeah. live too. That'd be That's fun. That's a great idea. Live tweet it. Oh yeah, um, and the problem is we don't know what movies are coming, so we can't even prepare for it. That's right, yeah. Because <laughs> he's pretty good. I mean, this one he did release because uh, he did allow everyone to know that it was going to be Q because of in honor of Larry, uh, late Larry Cohen. He was going to do it. We did know that one, but we did not know Society other than the Q of Darcy's hashtag orgies. Yeah. <laughs> there, so yeah. So so if, you, next... if you haven't seen it, you'll know what we mean if you see Society. So. So this next one coming up, I'm really excited about uh, Ghostbusters 1 and 2 is getting a steel book, but the uh, advantage to getting this one is it comes with t- with some rare newly discovered deleted scenes, yeah. including the long requested Fort Detmering scenes. So tell me about this, Brian, because I'm not su- super familiar with these. Yeah, I actually don't know myself. And I'm, I'm usually I had seen. So I thought I had seen all the deleted scenes on Ghostbusters from various different things. I don't know which what this one is, actually. And, you know, and I know I, I, th- I know pretty much a lot. Is I think I know a lot about Ghostbusters, but I yeah. guess like this one's a statement. I know I, I or, feel kind of bad. Yeah, or maybe it's just something we knew, but we but by referred to it by this Fort Demering name, yeah. we're not familiar with it. So when we get to see it, so some level I'm kind of excited because if I don't know what it is, it'll be kind of cool when we actually uh, get to see it. Because I'll you know, definitely might, pick this up. <laughs> yeah, it might actually get me to buy a steel book. Although it kind of sucks because I have a really nice Ghostbusters one and two collection. The 4K and everything. Yeah. I hate. This seems like kind of a waste to, to double dip on it. But if it has deleted scenes, I might have to. Yeah, and this is like I think the third or fourth version of Ghostbusters I bought. Somehow. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, but you know what? They keep finding a new way to bring me in there. So and then you know, and I think this is just you know what? I'm kind of caught up in the hype of the the 2020 Ghostbusters. So this is kind of cool. It's all like uh, you know, it's all just building up for uh, the the return of of the Ghostbusters we love. Yeah, twenty twenty. All right, so you got to see Pet Cemetery. I did not, unfortunately, because I've been so busy on the weekends. But tell me about Pet Cemetery in a non spoiler fashion. Yes, I, I will just tell. I'll I'll keep it brief. Um, because you know, obviously, there's you know, if, if you're fans of the book, I think will like it. Although there, you know, they're gonna there's some changes which I won't go into. Um, some are obvious if you've watched the trailer. Some maybe not. I really, really liked it. Julie liked it. She just said she she enjoyed it. But I I really liked it. I thought, um, I thought the just the the the, mo- the a more of a modern take on it. Uh, was there the a lot of things that creep me out about the first one are still there. In fact, one of them was even done even a little more so. And obviously, the bit one of the big ones we were concerned with was was you know John Lithgow's performance because you yeah. know Fred Gwynn it was so iconic. And I don't know if this is blasphemous, but I might have preferred John Lithgow's better. Oh, I intriguing. I was, yeah, I thought he killed it. I mean, I'm I will say I am a huge John Lithgow fan. I think he's just fantastic. Um, regardless of what he smells like, which I'm not sure. And this, <laughs> this I can kind of, you're definitely going to smell, he's going to smell like dirt and tobacco. But, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I just loved his performance in it. Um, I don't know. I mean, not, uh, of course, nothing to take away from the legendary Fred Gwynn, which I, uh, you know, of course I love that, but I don't know. I mean, I may be, I could be in the minority. I'm not sure. I'd love to hear what your take on it is, but I, I, I just thought John Lithgow was fantastic in this. And That's I mean, Jason good. Clark, Jason Clark was great in it. The kids were great. I mean, pretty much any, every, the performances in this were all top notch and fantastic. And it just, the whole vibe of the movie definitely had a, a I thought a more, a more of a cohesive version. Uh, you know, uh, like a, it just had a really consistent, creepy dark vibe more so than the other one did wow but um but you know i I, like i said i never read the book you read the book tim so you'll probably be the best judge on this for i'm just basically comparing it to movie versus movie so but yeah and not of course nothing the old one was another it was a classic of course too i just i don't know this is different enough that it could they could both equally stand uh side by side as versions of this movie but oh, I good. yeah I really liked the first one I it did okay I think it made like twenty five million a Shazam it was going up against Shazam which obviously will have the advantage because that's a family film that a lot more yeah. people can go to but I think it'll do better in the second week I think it'll improve the second week Sketon got a lot of good word of mouth from what I've seen on the internet so yeah I'm definitely gonna try to get it to it as quickly as I can I'm out of town again this weekend so it may not even be this weekend so I hope I catch it before it leaves the theater. 
I think it'll be there for at least a few weeks, so you should be okay. Uh, so Mark Hamill is ruining the new Child's Play remake <laughs> by voicing yeah. Chucky. It's kind of older news, but uh, it's something yeah. we didn't get to cover because of our, our HardCon preview. So yeah, Mark Hamill is the new voice of Chucky in the Child's Play remake, which was funny on the rundown. Uh, Brian said uh, that will prevent us from hating it completely. And I yes. put an editor's note in that it won't prevent me from hating it completely because even though I adore Mark Hamill, it's not enough to make me love a Child's Play remake. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, what I, here's the thing. I don't think I'll still go see it in the theater, but I will. I like I had planned on never watching it. <laughs> right. I think I'll <laughs> give it a I'll give it a watch when it comes to either cable or streaming service strictly for. My 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 affection towards Mark Hamill. So, yeah, yeah, I, I'm I sure will, he'll do but, great. With, with yeah, what he'll he be great. Maybe you know what? Maybe we should do. Maybe we should make a Mark Hamill edit where it's literally just his scenes. Yeah, and then just it'll <laughs> look like it's just a weird alternate universe version of of, of Chucky. <laughs> or we replace that horrible looking Chucky with the actual Chucky, and we just dub Mark Hamill's voice in or something. Yeah, but then, well, then we're kind of dissing poor Brad. Bird, <sighs> but I, 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 well, but just, we'll I was just remake would just go away. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah. Uh, why, why, Mark Hamill? Why, why did you have to even like tear my heart apart from this? Uh, <sighs> uh, I found I read across a little bit of uh, horror board game news. I, this one was completely off of my radar, but it sounded so cool. I had to put it on the rundown. There's a new board game coming out called Abomination: The Heir of Frankenstein. This is an announcement from Plaid Hat Games. I actually own a couple of their games, and I really enjoy them. And uh, this one just had an interesting theme to it. Uh, in Abomination, two to four players take on the role of scientists in 1800s Paris competing to complete the work of the infamous Dr. Victor Frankenstein. Scientists need to deploy assistants to raise money, charge laden jars, research new scientific findings, and most importantly, collect raw materials. So this sounds like a competitive game in which you're, each player is trying to complete a body of Frankenstein by... Uh, kind of a worker placement type aspect and strategy oh, that's game. Cool. It sounds really cool. The components look really neat. Uh, I'm going to definitely keep my eye out for this one because I've, I've not seen a game with this kind of cool theme on it before. It almost reminds me of Mousetrap a little bit, but with Frankenstein, you know, <laughs> how you have to like build it as you go along. That's kind of cool. Yeah. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, if I ever get my hands on it, I'll give you guys a review, but just to look for that one. I don't, I don't have a release date or anything. They just kind of did a press release on it. So, uh, next up, Sarah's Frightmare, a great Twitter account to follow for horror news. So this is at Sarah Frightmare. I need to check this one out, Brian. Yeah, well, we we follow her, and she follows us actually, and she's got a, she's actually a lot of where I get some of the news because she is like on top of everything. Like she gets all like she retweets a lot of the bloody disgusting stuff, a lot of from all various sources. So a lot of times. Um, like, you know, because I, I cannot be as – I like, I just can't get on as fast as I like to sometimes. I mean, I get a lot of stuff from Bloody Disgusting, but there's also – sometimes I'll get it from her retweeting the Bloody Disgusting because she's so on top of it. So, yeah, if you guys want a really up-to-the-minute horror news, she's a fantastic at retweeting and, and posting some stuff. So it's really, really good site to follow for horror news. And last but not least, a Cherokee Creek Blu-ray release. Yeah, the guys we they sent us that film. I, I watched it. I don't know if you got to watch it yet, Tim. It's the one about the uh, basically a bachelor party meets uh, Bigfoot movie, which, right? <laughs> which is is to, is really like classic campy '80s style uh, comedy. So if if you want that, they are on their site. Um, I you know what? I it's bad on my part. I did forgot the site. It's just like it's because it was it wasn't their site. So I um it's whatever they're producing it through. But if you look up, I'll we'll put that in the rundown. Um. But uh, just search uh, Cherokee Creek, uh, Cherokee Creek movie Blu-ray, and you will find uh, the link to the to the uh, site for it. Cool. All right, guys. So we have not done a disc memberment in a while, and usually I try to go back and recap the last couple weeks' releases, but just didn't have time to do it this week. So uh, I don't have the releases that we missed over the New Jersey Horrorcon preview. So my apologies for that. But let's get right back into the Blu-ray releases for next week. Uh, this will be the Blu-ray releases for Tuesday, April 16th. This is our disc memberment. Wait, no, please, God. No, don't cut off my... So this week, Brian, we have a very big release, of course, Glass from oh, uh, this year. Wait. 
of course, directed by M. Night Shyamalan, <laughs> uh, starring James. Sorry, I can't help myself every time I see his name. Starring James McAvoy, Bruce Willis, Samuel L. Jackson. Security guard David Dunn uses his supernatural abilities to track Kevin Wendell Crumb, a disturbed man who has twenty-four personalities. And Brian, I actually have not seen Glass yet. And what I kind of wanted to do now that it's coming out on Blu-ray is just kind of do a whole trilogy night and run through Unbreakable, uh, Split, and this one. Yeah, I want to do that when I get this too. Of course, I mean I have seen all three, but I'd love to watch them all in succession. I think that would be kind of a fun, fun triple feature. Yeah, I gotta say, you know, I'm really on point with my uh, my my one of my uh, my resolutions this year about seeing things in the theater because I pretty much I think the only one out of the horror ones that I missed was Prodigy, and it was only because it was out like a one week. Yeah, yeah, you <laughs> so have done I didn't really get good. a chance to see it. I have been absolutely so. terrible. I don't. God, I, th- I might have gone to one movie this year so far, and that was Captain Marvel. So I've been really bad about it. It's just hard, uh, you know. With, yeah, well, you got the uh, kids, the you got kids a lot of stuff, stuff going yeah. on, and you're, you know, sometimes you're on call. It's, it's, it's it tough, makes yeah. sense. Yeah, you got to go see us though. Also, you need to. See I know. Us. I'm like so far behind. I may may need to like take a Saturday off and just go see all this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> literally, just say yeah, just say sorry. So, uh, mom, take the kids. Olivia and I are going yeah, to see it, seven it, movies. It's for the it's for the podcast. The, yeah, the magical words. Uh, yeah. So this one has some really good special features. Um, I'm not going to read all of these because they're pretty lengthy. Yeah, uh, but there's a bunch of featurettes. Actually, I've got there's probably what ten featurettes on here, Brian. And uh, some interviews. Yeah, and I didn't think there was going to be that many when I first saw the disc announced. It announced it didn't really say anything about it. The 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 tons of features on this. Yeah, it looks like mostly uh, featurettes uh, for the most yeah. part. And then the in, interesting, the 4K includes some alternate an alternate opening and some deleted scenes. But I believe that's only on the 4K release. So that's kind mm-hmm. of an interesting. Uh, marketing gimmick to get people to buy 4K. I don't know if I like that because I don't. And know if- 4K TVs, yeah, yeah. I, know. I mean, I was thinking of upgrading soon as it is, but this one may be a, a tricky one for me. I'm not sure what I'm gonna have to do here. It's kind of interesting that a movie this new gets that many features, though, because usually the first release is pretty bare bones, and then later on they'll come out with a collector's edition or something. So yeah, a uh, pretty good, pretty good set of extras for a Universal disc. I'll have to say. Uh, next up is Superstition from 1982. This is a Shout Factory release directed by James W. Robertson, starring James Halton, Albert Salmi, and Lynn Carlin. A witch put to death in 1692 swears vengeance on her persecutors and returns to the present day to punish their descendants. This one looks pretty cool. Now, when I looked at the special features, there will be special features on these discs that I'm talking about here and the one coming up, Dex, which is a big one. I just yeah. did not, they didn't have them announced because they were waiting till closer to release. So definitely check the special features on this one because uh, there there may be some good stuff on here. That one looks cool. I, I've never seen Superstition, but maybe that'll come up in my uh, my 40 Years of Terror or something, maybe. Yeah, I want to say I know the, the movie. I don't know if I've seen it, though. That's the problem. Yeah. So that'll be if the one, yeah, maybe I'll have to look into that one, too. Uh, next up is... Of course, a Civil Gore classic, if you're a longtime listener, back from episode two, we did The Manitou from 1978, probably one of our best episodes, one of our most classic and fondly remembered episodes, and this is a just a crazy, crazy movie. Yeah. Directed by William Girdler, starring Tony Curtis, Susan Strasberg, and Michael and Sara. A psychic's girlfriend finds out that a lump on her back is a growing reincarnation of a 400-year-old Demonic Native American spirit. And that's not the, even the weirdest part of this whole movie. Yeah, there's space boobs in it. There's yeah. a, oh my an gosh. appearance by Burgess Meredith. <laughs> uh, there's it's just filled with, with, with excitement in this one. And uh, yeah, and it had some classic lines. And Tim and I just, oh my God, we enjoyed doing this thing. I almost want to, I wonder if like we should like almost, now that we have like a couple of years of Civil Gore, or, but maybe we should do it like or one of our first revisits. Oh and my revisit gosh, the Manitou as like an anniversary. Oh, okay. Hang on, I found thing some. Or something. I found some special features. Oh, nice. So it's a, a new 4K scan, a new restored stereo soundtrack, a new interview with author Graham Masterson, whose book this was based on. I read the book, and it is just as crazy as the movie is. New producing Girdler, an interview with executive producer David Sheldon, a new audio commentary with film historian. 
All right. Ding. There we go. Troy Haworth. So that's that's uh that's your reason to buy it alone. Yeah. Right, an original theatrical trailer, original TV spots, and a still gallery. I would love to hear what a film historian has to say about this movie. Yeah, this is one I am gonna. I'm going to dive into this. I already have it pre-ordered, so it's going to – from Amazon, so it'll release – I'll get it the day of release. Uh, I am going to dive into this disc and watch every single thing because I be, we've been waiting so patiently for like two years to like be able to get this because it was on Shutter originally when we watched it. And then it was like – I think it was only on there for another couple of months after we had discovered it. Right. And it denied our Manitou goodness away. And I mean, of course, you can get like – there were versions on DVD. You can get – that were like those reprint versions, and I see them at cons all the time. But I was waiting and hoping for it's a really a, a solid new version. Blu-ray, yeah, yeah. I think I I like to think we had something to do with it. I think once they heard our episode, they <laughs> began to Probably. began to work on this project. <laughs> well, the next release, they'll ask us to do the commentary, so maybe maybe we'll get on it with a, as our own special feature. Yeah, and they'll put our episode on there and everything. Um, I'll, going back to Superstition, I actually found the extras for that, so I'll run through those real quick. The Superstition we just talked about. Uh, that one's going to have a new 2K scan, an interview with director James Robertson, a interview with actor James Halton, a theatrical trailer, and TV spot. So no film historian commentary for that one, but still a nice little, little group of extras there. Uh, next up is Grave of the Vampire, 1972 from Shout Factory. Uh, Shop Factory is just churning them out this week. Uh, this yeah. one's directed by John Hayes, starring William Smith, Michael Pataki, and Lynn Peters. Croft, a legendary vampire, returns from sleep. Croft attacks a couple in a graveyard, raping the woman. The child what? born feeds only on blood from his mother's breast. So, so his her mother has a bleeding breast. Yeah, so this is a uh, vampire child born of vampire rape. And this is my birth year, uh, birth year movie for me. Wow, <laughs> what what, what a, such picks from when I was born. I don't know. Yeah, that's uh. that's kind of interesting. Uh, this one has a uh, new commentary with our good friend, film historian Troy Howarth. Ding ding ding! Thank you. Hey. A new commentary with film historians too: Nathaniel cool. Thompson and Howard Berger. So now you've got three film historians doing two commentaries on this disc. Uh, deleted scenes and theatrical trailers in the image gallery. I, I almost want this for all those historian commentaries. That's yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, like had to had to get them all on the same same disc. You yeah, know? so that sounds pretty neat. And then next up we have uh, Brian's guess, and I cannot wow. wait to hear what he comes up with this one. This is yeah, this is a movie called Master of Dark Shadows. It's from 2019. It's released by MPI Media Group and it's directed by David Gregory. And it stars the great Ian McShane, Whoopi Goldberg, and Roger Davis. <laughs> what kind of cast is this? So is... Tell me what Master of Dark Shadows is all about. Oh my god! <laughs> I, you know, it's like you know, and the problem is with the term Dark Shadows. You know, I'm like kind of heading towards something with that, but I don't think it could be that. Oh god, it's. It... <laughs> You know what? I'm going to go out on a crazy limb here. Is this something to do with Jack the Ripper? <laughs> Just because maybe he hides it in no. the shadows? No. Okay. All right. Well, that, that's not my real guess. Um, Dark Shadow. It can't be a vampire movie. That's too, like, obvious or something because, oh, God. Like, what kind of movie would star Ian McShane and Whoopi Goldberg? Just I, think about it. I don't know. A Western version of Ghost? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, what else could it be? <laughs> um, oh God, I really, I, I really am. I, I don't know. She, I, I, you know what? I, I can't think. Of, so I'm gonna have to just go get. It. All right, it's somehow. Uh, I don't know. Whoopi Goldberg's uh, hunting a serial killer. I don't know. <laughs> I can't. Think. I give up. You give up. Yeah. All right. So I tricked you this week, Brian. This is actually a documentary about dark shadows. Oh, man. <laughs> so that was a that was a bit of a trick, but So I was close. I started with dark did. shadows. You did. You should have gone with your first uh, instinct, but the the problem was our our dismemberment this week was so short. I didn't really have much to choose from, so I knew you might yeah. not guess this one, but yeah, it is a, a documentary about the gothic world of Dan Curtis. So 1966, the phenomenon of the dark shadows soap opera. Mm. Gothic uh soap opera. And uh, this is a documentary all about that. And um it's got uh, 
reminiscence from Whoopi Goldberg. Ian McShane narrates. That's where he comes in. So yeah. that, that's where this kind of comes from. I'd actually like to watch this because I like Dark Shadows. I thought that was a cool. In hindsight, so. though, I'd like to see a Western version of Ghost. <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty cool. Oh, by the way, speaking of Western ghost stories, I was uh, listening to the Film Threat podcast, and there's a horror movie he was uh, talking about called The Wind. And it's oh, an I, where did I just film. see that? I saw that on a list somewhere. Yeah, it sounds really, really good. He talked with the uh, with the director, and it it just sounds like a did, really cool story. Oh, you know what? Maybe they tweeted it. They might have tweeted something about the movie, and that's where I saw the name. Yeah, I want to track that I one saw down. It, t- it was like today. I think I saw it. Yeah, I, I want to track it down. It sounds really. It looks like a western like horror thriller. So, which I'm a sucker for. So, yeah, I definitely want to want to check that out. Oh, I think it's in theaters actually now. Oh, really? Well, that, yeah, that's another one to add to my backlog. Well, yeah, but but just so uh, this don't feel guilty on this one. It's it's right. I think it's literally like really like short theater. You know, like a, it's like a, a very specific cities. It's probably like probably very cities, limited. Like, yeah, like New York, Chicago, L.A. Like it's like that from what it looks like. Because basically, when I'm looking at it now, it says. Get tickets or watch now in three theaters near Los Angeles. So oh, it's not okay. even in New York yet. So it yeah. could be very, very. Oh, but you can rent it on Prime. It's on Prime. You can rent it. So oh. it's one of those. I guess it's like a direct to uh to VOD. So you can. It's, I think it's four bucks on Prime. Oh, yeah. maybe I'll do that then. Yeah, yeah, I know. I might have to check this out myself. And then uh, theatrical releases. Do we have any this week? Let's see. This week is Hellboy, which is kind of horror adjacent, I guess. Yeah, uh, I'd say yeah. But uh, that, that's it. Well, and well, we got a couple of good ones coming up. I don't know when they are though. Yeah. Like Ma and um and La Llorona. Yeah, La Llorona is coming out April nineteenth. Ah, it was a week. Okay, it was a week off. Okay, that's what because I just keep seeing the trailer for it. I, that looks really good. Yeah, I like that. That'll so be good. Uh, Hellboy be, may be cool, but I don't like the fact that um they uh, replaced the. The main actor, he doesn't. Look, he, th- he doesn't the theme look right. this year. Yeah, but he doesn't. <laughs> he just doesn't look right to me. Yeah, like the makeup. Yeah. He doesn't. Well, whatever. I mean, I'll, I'll probably like it'll be one of those. It'll eventually be on cable. I'll probably watch it then. Yeah, but I like the original Hellboy movies. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's. And plus, if I go to uh, SuperCon this year, I've already met Doug Jones, who of course played um, Abe. Sapien in the first Hell, Hellboy movies, but I'll also get to meet um, God. Why am I drawing a blank on saying Ron Perlman from who played Hellboy in the first two movies? So oh, he's gonna nice, be he's gonna be nice. a super con. Man, that looks like a packed convention. John Cleese. I mean, yeah, that's crazy. How did he I don't know how did he even get in there. Basil know. Fawlty himself. Yeah. I you know I mean the only thing I, the horror thing I can think of remotely is he played the the. The headless ghost in Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah. Well, this that, isn't a horror that. con. It's just a super con. So oh, oh, okay. okay. It's, it's I'm so used to horror cons yeah. now. I'm in horror con mode. Now, <laughs> so that's what. All right. So let's get to our main feature. This is The Fly from 1986, directed by David Cronenberg. So, of course, it features a lot of body horror, uh, starring Jeff Goldblum, which we haven't done a Jeff Goldblum impression yet. We've, we're 45 minutes I, in and haven't done a Jeff Goldblum impression. Well, no, we did, we did remotely one because uh, we did him. Uh, didn't he was in one of the Kill Tell sketches, I think. Yeah. I'm in for this uh, episode. Was... We haven't done one yet. Oh, no. We had not yet. I was saving him. Oh, I figured okay. we'd save him for during this, this okay. sequence. Uh, Gina Davis and John Getz. A brilliant but eccentric scientist begins to transform into a giant man-fly hybrid after one of his experiments goes horribly wrong. Of course, this is a remake of the original The Fly. And, man, what a movie to attempt to remake because it, the – the original fly was was really cool for the day, but if you look at it from a modern perspective, it seems kind of like a silly concept. And for them yeah. to make a, a remake, you really have to do something special with it so it doesn't come off really, really I mean, it, this movie could have gone dangerously corny if they yeah. if they were not careful in it. But man, they they picked a perfect person for the job in David Cronenberg to to bring the darkness to this film. And uh, it was a lot of fun watching this again. I remember watching this movie religiously as a kid. Well, not as a kid. I guess it came out in 86. I was eh, 12 years old at the time. Uh, I guess I was a kid. Uh, early <laughs> teens. And uh, just watched it all, all, especially when VHS hit and I could rent it. So, uh, yeah, I remember being 
completely mesmerized and mesmerized and horrified by this movie. Yeah, I actually saw this in theater. My mom took me to see this, um, and I was like, I, I did not expect like the the kind of the level of gore and how much I would love it, and and uh, like more, you know, like Friday nights, you know, back in the eighties, it was it was like renting a movie at a friend's house with pizza or something, and and like pretty much for a while, that was the movie we watched over and over again. My friend Mark and I, every Friday night, we'd pretty much watch this. And we'd like we'd have like our parts we like there'd be just scenes that we would like always laugh at or we'd have a little it was like a, a way way version uh like a smaller version of like a Kim and Ket where we were like naming people things. like we had uh we had uh John Getz's character we either named him Guy Arm Come Off or Guy Leg Corrode <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was that was some crazy effects it sort of reminds me of the Blob remake in that. It took a classic movie and just updated it with these just horrendously gory effects that were just so over the top. And looking back on it, after I watched it again, some of the effects still hold up really well. Some of them don't. Um, the uh, kind of the Seth Brundle's later transformations where he's kind of like in a rubber suit looking thing uh, didn't hold up as well as I remembered from my childhood. But uh, other than I mean, it still holds up pretty good for a movie from 1986. I'll have to say. Oh yeah, no, there's there and there are some fantastic effects. I mean, and they're all practical, which is, uh, you know, it's it's kind of refreshing, of course, right? Um, when you see those those practical effects, and it's not because yeah, sure, could it have been like done with digital and have it look like near perfection? Yeah, but there's something actually that makes it imperfect is the, the good part about it. You know, it's like you want to see the little slight, almost slight imperfections because it kind of brings you back that nostalgia. And, you know, but I mean, and for as, as far as gore goes, it kind of like, you really, I, I think if you're watching it for the first time, I don't think you nearly expect the type of gore you're going to get. I mean, you get the one, the scene, of course, uh, with the, the baboon. And, you know, you're like, but, but even then it's kind of like, it's gory, but it's like, it's, uh, like it's not like gory gory like it's very basic gore but what you get later on i mean in terms of of just the the transformation and the the the, the grossness of it really for lack of a better word it just keeps building and building and building <laughs> and yeah. you know it's like but it's it's but it's so fantastic and just the the performances are so good throughout too and it's like you know, you know, it's just I, I like I watched again, and I'm just like it was like I literally memorized everything already, like it like instantly, and I hadn't seen it. Like I said, like I think I saw it once in the past like ten years, <laughs> and it literally I uh, like, but watching it again, I like just totally brought it all back. I remembered everything. Yeah, well, it starts <laughs> off very innocently. I was kind of surprised. I mean, again, you know, when you're younger and watch this, you're all you remember is really the the horror aspects. So right. I was watching it again, and you, you have the slow kind of uh, courtship, I guess you could say, between uh, Jeff Goldblum and Gina Davis, who are a real-life couple at the time, actually. Yeah. Uh, and um, so you get to kind of watch it. He's so fantastic. He, he's just so good in this movie. And uh, you got to watch this kind of slow drama unfold. And I'm sitting here thinking, oh, my God, like if I was watching this for the first time, like you said, there would be no way – I would expect where this movie was going in terms of the effects and things, because it just doesn't strike you as that kind of movie right off the bat. No, it, it's actually very, uh, yeah, it almost looks like super like scientific, -y, you know, like yeah. you're going to get this like really high, like tech, you know, and I think that, that, that is all credit to Jeff Goldblum's performance because he just plays that so well. You know, and just like when he gets excited, you know, he's just like, eh, you know, I'm deep macular contraction, you know, and he's like, throwing all these words and I can't even say them. And he's and he's going back at like this light speed. And I'm like, oh, my God, I can't even understand a thing he's saying. You know, it's like it's, and it's like, you know, and just some of his lines in it, like, I mean, like I thought like he, he has like such comedic lines thrown in there, which are like are so kind of like they don't you know, it's like they 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 don't hit as uh, like the comedic beat as if you like 
pull it out and listen to the line. It's hilarious. But in the way he does it, it doesn't like you can acknowledge that it's a funny line, but you don't, but you're so caught up in the, the 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 horror of the movie that it doesn't break your concentration from the horror. You know, like the one line when he's like bringing the girl up. You know, it's getting you know he's kind of out of control, and it was right after that uh, the arm. Uh, Oh, wrestling God, scene, yeah. which, I'll, which I'll get to later. We'll get. I made a comment on that one. Um, but he's running up the stairs, and you know, you could just tell he's starting to get like, like his mind is going, and you know, and she's just drunk and kind of thinking it's just like a one night stand thing. And, and like the line there cracks me up. She's like, "Oh, don't you have an elevator?" And he goes, "Here you go." And he picks her up. And goes, Do you feel elevated? You know, <laughs> it's like it's just like stuff like that. Or and then later when Gina Davis walks in and he's like, "Oh, I forgot to tell you, I I, I live with my mother too." You know, it's like just like classic Goldblumish lines. You know, and it's like throughout the whole thing, and it's just. I, I, you know, he's, you know, he can't, I can't, like, and we'll get to, like, in the facts of who other, other people that were, could have played him, and, like, other than for our own enjoyment, probably, yeah, I can't picture it. Oh, and that, but even today, you know, most people, I guess most people think of Jeff Goldblum, they think of Jurassic Park, probably. Right. But in my mind, I always think of The Fly first. Like, oh, to, me too. To me, that was 100%. his signature role for me. That was my first, ex- like, memorable exposure to Jeff Goldblum. I know he'd been in some stuff before it, but that's what I remember. And I was like, after I saw that, I'm like, who is Jeff Goldblum? I want him in everything. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Speaking of uh, exposure, he, he does show his, uh, his buttocks in this one. So, uh, (laughs) yeah, he's, so he, as, as we write on here, it says he was, now he gained his entry into the civil gore man nudity lore. (laughs) So along with, with Donald Sutherland. So I don't know if we got to keep an archive of uh, man, man nude, in uh, Civil yeah. War history, but uh, he he earns an honorable mention if if not. Well, places. we have an in, we have an intern. That's Cody. <laughs> Cody, you're listening. You're we have another intern assignment for you. Keep track of all the male male butt nudity for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so there man, there's so many horrific scenes in this movie. I don't even know where to begin. Uh, his his transformation stuff is just pure body horror. I mean, when you hear the term body horror, you think about you know, all the stuff that really makes you cringe, like stuff going into eyeballs. But this one, man, oh. for me, it was the teeth falling out. That just horrified yeah. me. That Well, that's one of the, remember, that's, a, that's one of the most common, um, like, dreams that people have that that represents something you know when you get like some dream experts and the fear is always like and it translates i literally think to you're being afraid of something i think i I could be wrong if there's any dream experts out there i know it means something like that you're nervous about something something to do with the teeth falling so it's like whether that was intentional or not or just a happy coincidence but yeah that that was traumatizing um uh one of the ones uh, the arm wrestling scene to this day and I and I mean this. I cannot watch an arm wrestling match between anybody. <laughs> I can't watch that. I will not participate in one. That is like the, any kind of bone popping out of something to me is always my like my nightmare. And I don't know if you just saw there's that thing. I, I refused to watch it about the gymnast today or something that broke her legs on a landing or something. Her legs like bent the wrong way or something. I oh, watch it. I remember that. I, um, ba- there's a basketball player. A year or yeah. two ago that landed the wrong way and his bone literally just came out of his leg. Oh. Yeah, I can't like that is my biggest fear when I play sports. I like that, you know, and then, I, you know, I listen, we've all seen the Joe Theismann. But like that, that this one is just like and it's because when you're watching it, you know, I you don't expect it. And I remember when I saw that, I was literally like traumatized forever from that. <laughs> you know, what was weird. The scene. And when I saw it, I had not thought about the scene in forever. But when I saw it, it instantly like brought me back to my childhood trauma was the scene where Gina Davis is dreaming which at the time. You don't know it's a dream that she gives right. birth to Jeff Goldblum's baby and it comes out as a maggot. And yeah. I remember that scene just completely scarred me as a kid. I don't know what it was about it. I don't know if I was just kind of didn't like childbirth stuff anyway. Like the whole, Oh, the whole thing about babies used to really freak me out. Like, you know, like a baby coming out mutated or something used to always like be a, like a traumatic thing in movies. But then when that maggot thing came out, it just, Oh my God, that scene just really freaked me out. And when I saw it again today, I was like, Oh my God, I now remember that I blocked it from my mind. But, uh, yeah. So that was kind of cool. And, um, then the, uh, the whole, 
like all the like the coarse hair like coming out of him and stuff. Oh god. It was... Yeah, and then the the, the ear falling off. I yeah. mean, just like little literally it's like it's such a slow transformation. And that was intentional. I mean, I'm jumping ahead to one of the facts, but they um well actually but I put I actually I sorry, I took I put this fact up ahead actually. It was from a thing I read a couple of places where the original script for this actually had him transforming and losing his brundleness much sooner. And but but then when um when Jeff Goldblum was cast, uh Cronenberg rewrote the script so he could be there'd be more Goldblum in it, which, you know, more Goldblum is always better. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's like so and because I think that's what made this movie is that, you know, you really like just you know, you could put yourself in the fan like cuz he's a likable guy. And then he it's this tragic grueling transformation as he's just losing his humanity towards the thing and you like you feel like you're long with the way like even when they skip ahead to like a couple of days it's like they almost you almost get like a weird recap by something else bad happening during it you know so you could see like okay you really didn't miss much you know yeah (laughs) it's like here's some here's some gore here here's his ear falling off and and he's but when he's biting his nails now i'm a nail biter a fingernail biter i bite my fingernails and when he's biting the thing and the whole nail comes off and it's oh yeah it's, so he's got to wear gloves but it is kind and... of interesting to see a monster movie in which the transformation takes over the takes the course of the entire movie and it's not like an instantaneous or like an overnight transformation or a recurring where it like happens and he comes back and it, you know right, like yeah. like, a, like a werewolf yeah it's it's yeah it's it's one of those yeah it it's it's i mean i I had seen the original years ago, and like you said, there's just something like a little bit hokey about it. So, I mean, this is one of the cases where I think, at least, I prefer the the remake way more than the original. And nothing against, obviously, Vincent Price, but yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's just, I mean, to me, that's my the fly. You know, I, I I mean, I get it. I'm sure there's some film historians out there. They'll be like, "What are you talking about? How could you bash the original?" I mean, but I think they're different enough that you know. You can they can both exist fine, and, and one's like doesn't have to replace the other. Yeah, well, I think I mean, forty years is a decent time for a remake of a movie right. to bring it up to modern standards. <laughs> I mean, I, we're doing that now with movies made in the eighties or the late seventies. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's a uh, completely legit to remake movies that were that could deserve a remake just due to technological leaps and jumps or spider-man which has been remade like literally three times since the yeah 90s. see that's a that's so. a silliness but yeah i mean when you have a very good reason to remake something because technology has advanced to the point where you can serve the story better and stuff i have no problem with that oh no no i was gonna say well the first one was definitely it was it was it was horror but very light on the horror as this one was like pure horror so i think there's a definitely a different much more a different take on it by far so yeah, explore some really cool fears, but on multiple levels. I, on one level, you have it's it's a monster movie, right? Um, so you have the, you know, the beauty and the beast type thing going on. You've got the fear right. of technology, technology turning against us. Uh, you've got the fear of disease of of you know like cancer or something that that hits you and then you just degrade over time. That's kind of an underlying fear. Yeah, and then paranoia is a big aspect of it because he's – I mean all the, all the paranoia that he has leads to basically a lot of bad decisions in this. Right, yeah. So there's so. – it's, it's an interesting movie that plays on a lot of different kinds of fears and maybe all that together is what makes it such a great remake. Yeah, there's I, – I put a couple of notes down too as you could see in there, a couple of uh, things. I said there's one uh, – one's a funny one where I said she either has the world's best tape recorder or the thinnest purse <laughs> because, uh, you know, Gina Davis's character – in the beginning, she literally takes the tape recorder, sticks it in her purse – and then, I've, and then you know, like then she plays the tape back, and it's literally as if it was like a high def recording of his voice to perfection. You know, now muffled, nothing at all. I mean, I know that's just movie magic kind of thing. But the one thing I put, I put, I don't know if you see there, I put fun discussion point, and this is one of the ones which we don't really do this too, too often when we do the movies. But it's kind of like a 
one of those those things. Like obviously, you know, I, and I go back to I think I've mentioned this before that uh, one of my film studies teachers in high school, she said, "Buy the premise, buy the flick," which was a quote by somebody. Where it's like, you know, you just go buy into the movie and enjoy it. But sometimes it's funny to discuss some of the things, and I put down like the science, uh, the scientific anomalies. So if you think about it, right? So he goes, he does this this technology, right, where he's in the the pod. And then he can get transported there and it f- fix everything. But so I said, wouldn't it? I mean, technically, you would figure it would have to be a 100 percent sterile environment because what all the possibility of like a dust particle or a, a microscopic insect that you would never even possibly see. You know, it's like he's like if you think about it, he's lucky just it was a fly that went in, there, you know, because it's like, look at all the things that could have gone in there. Yeah, and I thought I've thought about that too. I remember thinking about this back when I first watched it, and was like thinking about well, you're not going to get rid of every bacteria or right. microscopic germ. Now, the ones in your body would probably get replicated with you, but anything right. around it would probably get integrated in, and maybe you wouldn't even notice it for a while, or maybe you wouldn't notice it at all, depending. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, and think about it. I mean, because he's like, I mean, he did. He was like in a, in a, in a, in a like a, like I guess a, the top floor of like some cold warehouse was his apartment, and his apartment did not have the essence of like being like freshly dusted with pledge. You no, know what I'm no. saying? So it's like, like I like I can't even imagine that there was no, nothing else could have actually got into that thing, and uh, and especially the way that you find out that this this the the computer figures things out it literally breaks it down and rebuilds it so everything basically breaks down everything that's in there and then puts it all into one so it's like any kind of dust any kind of foreign thing in the air that you would never see would technically go along with it and this machine would be able to pick it up and assimilate it into the the final project but you know, be that as may, you know, you, like I said, you suspend that. But then I always, then I said, I said, well, couldn't he, like, basically, if this computer realized the two things that it put together, when he had the third pod, what if he went right away in there? I mean, of course, we don't have a movie, but if he went right away and he had the re- whole thing reversed. Basically said, okay, take all the stuff from Brundle, take all the stuff from this fly that you found, now separate them. And he goes from the third pod and splits it back into the one and two pod. Yeah, because it could <laughs> you know, analyze so, the DNA and know which was fly and which was Brundle. Right, because it did. Remember, yeah. it said fly. So, like, yeah, in theory. But granted, you remember is is he was – I. but what was so good about it, they kind of covered for that, if you think about it. Because at first he thought he was purified and he was doing good. It was when he realized what was happening, it was too late, I think. So I think that's what it was. And, he, you know, his mind started to go, and I think the fly – persona started to gradually start to take over and was basically doing a lot of stuff so yeah but i mean that that, that you know and we're not trying to diminish diminish the movie in any way because it's, it literally is one of my favorite horror movies of all time it's just kind of fun discussion piece you now, know? Hey, you get a little techie do you remember when they did this gimmick at the universal monster makeup show at universal no i don't think i had ever been to that florida universal one they had this. they used to do a fly thing where they would actually do a teleportation pod they had the two teleportation pods on the stage and they would do it from one to the other oh, uh, it cool. was like of course obviously it was an illusion it yeah yeah but uh but it was really cool uh it was i remember that fondly from from my youth uh back in the early early days when i first went to universal uh, they had this this fly teleportation gimmick. I hope I'm not making that up. I, I'm almost no. Positive. I yeah. Now that you said that, I kind of remember pictures of it yeah. possibly from something. You know, actually, now that you said that, how great would a haunt be for this? Yeah, that would a be walk really through cool. Haunt. Yeah. Because you could like totally start through like the lab and you see him doing stuff and you see the baboon and like maybe the baboon will pop out against the the screen, you know, the the bloody paw come up against oh, the thing. Oh, that would be cool. I, yeah. Yeah. You know, you take some liberties, add some scares, but then a man imagine where you're just walking through and you have like the transformation of Goldblum's character yeah. like, popping out at yeah, you. Yeah. The scare actors could come up in various stages of yeah. decomposition until you get to the end. Yeah. That'd be. A fantastic haunt. It really lends itself well. 
Yeah, that would I think it would be a really really good one. It'd be, it'd be it wouldn't be super long, but you know some aren't that long. Yeah. They're just effective, and that one be a good effective one. That that's we need to put that as a Kickstarter because yeah. that's that's a good <laughs> idea. Well, let's go through some of the uh, trivia and deleted scenes. So, uh, deleted scenes related, there was an infamous cat monkey scene where Brundlefly fuses a cat. I like to call him just Brundlefly. He fuses a cat and the remaining baboon and then beats it to death with a lead pipe, but it was cut following a Toronto screening. Uh, According to producer Stuart Kornfeld, the, or what is it, Kornfeld, Kornfeld? I'm having a hard time. I think it's Kornfeld. It, yeah. yeah. The audience felt that there was no turning back for Seth and they lost all sympathy for his plight, which caused the rest of the film not to play as well. Uh, in Kornfeld's own words, if you beat an animal to death, even a monkey cat, your audience is not going to be interested in your problems anymore. <laughs> now, have you seen this scene? I have not seen this scene, no. So it was on my, I have the, I, I the version I watched was my old, uh, I thought I had it on Blu-ray. I had never got it yet. I upgraded, but I had the two disc sets that came out for Fly and Fly 2 that came out uh, years back. And so this had the deleted scene on it and I watched it. This scene is disturbing. The monkey cat alone is just try- like I remember the 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 dog scene in the fly too like still makes me cringe and then the the first baboon sequence in this yeah is traumatized but this is traumatized because literally one end is the baboon and one end is the cat and they're both like freaking out and uh. he's literally got to just slam it it is disturbing it is as disturbing as some scenes in this movie is if this was in there this would just be like and I could see it because I don't think you could. Like it was try- like it's weird. I don't think I like since I saw it out of context. I just saw it as a deleted scene, you know. I don't know like, and I wasn't really sure where it was placed in the movie at that point. So, you know, I you know he started to be kind of deteriorated. But I know you are like there's that moment where then you start to feel bad for him again as it gets near the end. And yeah, you might have had trouble getting that pulled out of you if if you saw this scene because this is just brutal. Like any animal kind of. Yeah, or things to children, I just are, are rough for me, and so yeah, this this one was this was tough to watch. Even though, of course, you know it's a real effect, but you know, just imagining a little, you know, poor cat and a baboon, and you know, <laughs> uh, it's rough. Uh, there's another deleted scene about uh, that was never filmed; it was scripted, where uh, it was going to be after the monkey cat scene, where a homeless lady interrupts Brundlefly as he feeds out of an open dumpster, and then he seizes the bag lady and disintegrates her face with his vomit drop. But before he finishes feeding on the woman's corpse, his humanity emerges for a moment just long enough to contemplate the horror of his subhuman existence. So that that sounds kind of cool, too. Um, yeah, that one would have been cool, I think, because, yeah, you know, that, that he actually has a thought process to it. But, you know, also going back to that other scene, you know, where he beats the thing, he does it at, to, I think, to kind of like, it's like a combination. I think he's like kind of putting it out of its misery. A little bit, cause especially if you go think back to the how he was so horrified at the uh, baboon disaster. He's, you know, so I don't know. I, I guess it like, but I could see how it could go both ways. Yeah. Uh, some of the trivia here, I'm not going through all of these, but I'll go through some of the ones. Uh, one thing we really want to talk about was some of the people that turned down this role. Oh, my God. So, yeah. First up, Michael Keaton. Now, I think he could have pulled it off. I think he Mike, could. I think Michael Keaton could have pulled it off. Yeah, out of this list, he's the only one, and, and, and there's some beloved people on this list. But that's that. He's the one I could actually see doing it because he's got that like psychotic, like ver- version he could play. Like that's why I thought he was so good as Batman because of his Bruce Wayne. Yeah, exactly. You know, his Bruce Wayne that like, uh, you know, kind of got that weird sinister side about him, and he's just like, oh, he's still my favorite him. Batman. He's yeah. Oh, mine day, too. Yeah. Mine too. That that's my you know my the Batman that I grew movie Batman that right, I grew yeah. up with. Of course, is Adam West. But um, and he uh, you know, and like and like you see him in in uh, Birdman, and you know, just all these like, you know, it's just like he's came, he can pull off that psychosis, which is just great. So the other ones we had were, I swear this reads like a Civil Gore <laughs> dream <laughs> dream list, right? <laughs> uh, John Lithgow. Believe it or not, yeah. I, I wish I could do a uh, a good version of John Lithgow, but I can't. I can only do the one from like Santa Claus. The movie was like for free, <laughs> but um, you know, I, I you know, like I can't really do a, a 
full John Lithgow. I cannot but, uh, imagine John Lithgow in this role. Oh my god. Yeah, he just didn't see. He seems too like Lithgow. I don't. You know what I mean? He's like he's like he's his own thing. Yeah, you know? he's like, his I own don't thing. think he would have. I mean, and we did see him as psychotic in yeah. Raising Cain, but still, I don't know if he, like, in this type of way, no. he would have been endearing. So. And then finally, the okay. one that just blows my mind, yeah, uh, Richard Richard Dreyfuss. I, know, can, 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 I can't imagine this. He's like, fuck is what I'm thinking. <laughs> you know, do you feel elevated, Faye? <laughs> you know, it's like, I can't, I can't imagine, like, him... Like, uh, you know, like, go through that, you know. Oh. I'm Brundlefly. <laughs> you know, it's like, what? Like, where would he, like, pull that off? I can't <coughs> that. I would, oh my I would God. constantly be waiting for that, you know? Oh, my God. Uh, we should do a... Oh, man. It sounds like a Saturday Night Live sketch where they do all the people really auditioning does. for the role. Oh, my God. Yeah. I, well, that's where my Richard Dreyfus impersonation really came from, remember? It was the Daryl Hammond, Richard Dreyfus. When he was doing C-3PO. Yeah, he was auditioning yeah. C-3PO. I am a my fuck all droid. <laughs> yeah. I'm very used to doing binary load leaders. <laughs> yeah, but, like, yeah, so it's, like, yeah, like, that's where, like, my Richard Dreyfus kind of stems from, and then I kind of uh, tweaked it into an actual Richard Dreyfus. But, yeah, oh I God. cannot. I'm sorry. We love Richard Dreyfus, as you know, on this show. There is no way in hell I could see this role. He turned it down. and But I don't see him in this role at all. Did he really get offered it is the question? <laughs> or did he just say he turned it down? I'm like, who know, offered he just, it like, that? He heard, yeah, imagine he just heard. He was in the studio and he heard they were doing it. He just walked in and he goes, I say no. I refuse. <laughs> You know, it's like, but I can't. Yeah, I can't picture like him in this role. I don't. Uh, oh, yeah, man. a whole different movie. It's funny that uh, this we we're talking about Jurassic Park. So one of these good little trivia bits here was uh, Veronica tells Seth that something went wrong, uh, which is a line that is used again in uh, Jurassic Park when Ellie Sattler tells Ian Malcolm Goldblum's character in Jurassic Park the same thing. And they were both in the same habit of wearing the same set of clothes every day. So he, his Ian Malcolm character is actually very close to this uh, Seth Brundle character. It is. Character. It's like the very early Brundle. Yeah, you know, it really like is. the way how he's like he he like kind of like you could see his joy in just hearing his own voice speak and say something. You know that it's like that same that same like. Like the way he is when he's describing his, uh, his, you know, his telepods, he's getting all excited, just like when he talking about his chaos theory and he gets all excited. You know, same, yeah, very, very similar role. Yeah. Well, let's get to our beer pairing, Brian, because you had a fantastic beer pairing for this week. <laughs> yeah. And this I've never heard of, but apparently I think it's like a current beer, actually. So if you want to run out and go to your store and maybe try and find it and we'll go rewatch The Fly right now. Um, <laughs> It's by the Coney Island Brewing Company, Brooklyn, New York. Um, they make some decent stuff. Um, and it's called Hefe Goldblum. <laughs> <laughs> so there literally is a Jeff Goldblum beer out there. And it's classic, dynamic, and a little bit nutty, like our favorite chaotician <laughs> from a certain fictitious dinosaur park. Hefe Goldblum is a Dunkelweizen made with caramel malt. And aged and aged on a cr- on cracked walnuts. <laughs> this is with notes of banana, vanilla, apple, and clove. This dark wheat is balanced by a nut finish, just kind of like Jeff Goldblum himself, right? I think that, that might be what finish. he smells like: uh, caramel malt, cracked walnuts, banana, vanilla, apple, and clove. I think that could be a very You're right. I think that is. Of course, that that's that's just Brundle Goldblum, not Brundle Fly, because yeah. then he's got probably some lot more disgusting smells <laughs> coming out of him. But uh, yeah, so it's a six percent uh abv and an ibu of 20 and it's so it's a dunkelweizen and so and i did so i put an honorable mention every so often when i come across something so there is actually a guy that brews out of his basement and he named it the brundlefly brewery and it's a pico brewery so really tiny it says it's in his basement and he basically has this little all-electric setup using two kegs and um, I guess he's and he's located in Helena, Montana. So apparently there's some big fly and Seth Brundle fans out there. <laughs> That's but, cool. But uh, yeah, so I had to put that down just because, of course, of Brundle Fly Brewery. So well, yeah, that's that. <laughs> you guys have been waiting a long time for the answer to our triple threat, uh, which I think most of you got. Uh, yeah, one guy actually emailed us that yeah. he got it right, and I think Cody might have said that yeah, you got it. Yeah, I think too. I think we had some people get this one because it was pretty darn easy. Uh, so we were looking for an actor or actress, and these were the clues. Throughout my career, I've played roles where I battled ghosts, aliens, and even Moses. I worked with both William Hurt and John Hurt. 
and I was the first person to win two acting Golden Globes in the same year. And of course, we were looking for Miss Sigourney Weaver. She fought aliens in the Alien franchise, in uh, Galaxy Quest, Ghostbusters 1 and 2, and even Moses in Exodus, Gods and Kings. And of course, it's a very good movie, by the way. <laughs> yeah, she also uh, starred with uh, John Hurt in Alien and William Hurt in Eyewitness. And she won the Best Actress Drama in 1988 for Gorillas in the Mist, which is a fantastic movie, and yeah. Best Supporting Actress for Working Girl. So uh, that's who we were looking for there. And now this week, this one, I'm a little on the fence on whether it's going to be easy or hard. I think the first two clues are pretty hard, but the last clue yeah. may may give it away. So listen carefully. Yeah, I, I tried to balance it. when I You know, I don't want to give three impossible clues right, ever. Right, yeah. So I always have to kind of give me a good, but you know, that's the beauty of this game is that sometimes, you know, that last clue, while it seems so easy, if you're not paying attention to the first two, it could throw you off in the wrong direction. That's right. So here we go. We are looking for a film this time, an actual film. And clue number one, two actors from this film also appeared in Star Wars Return of the Jedi. Clue number two. This film was the first film to win an Academy Award in a specific category. It was the first year of that category's creation. And clue number three, the director and crew of this film went on to be behind one of the most famous music videos of all time. So what? Yeah, so that last one is probably the one that'll <laughs> probably may be a giveaway. Yeah, but but uh, we're looking for a movie, so we'll have to post those clues on social media. So, uh, so check those out. Uh, by the way, we still have our prize pack contest going on. If you leave us a review, a written review on iTunes, you'll be entered to win a civil gore prize pack. We got a lot of goodies in there and I think it's about time. Uh, Brian, will have to post some pictures from some of the stuff that you may yeah. win. We've got some really cool posters, uh, a lot of cool swag. We're going to have a Blu-ray in there. Um, it might even be a really, really cool photo. That we're putting in. Yeah, there. so uh, you'll definitely want to just take five minutes and write us a, a iTunes review and get entered to win because there's not many reviews out there. So you have a really good chance right now. Yeah. And, uh, those reviews, of course, help us get noticed. They help us uh, get listeners. So we'd really appreciate if you uh, do your part to, uh, if you like us, to uh, drop us yeah. a review. So. Yeah, and even and also you know because I mean like I know we have a couple we have two, two of the, uh, two of the eleven are legit and the other nine are Tim and I just doing pseudonyms. <laughs> and uh, no, I'm only kidding. No, they were all legit reviews. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also, uh, guys, uh, we love hearing from you in email. We got some people that email us pretty regularly. We got uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I'm trying to get back on our Instagram game. I think we're doing a good job lately yeah. of of getting. Yeah, I even posted food that I made just to get us. Yeah, pictures on Instagram. So uh, yeah, so, so we'll uh, and we we have we have a secret waiting in the wings, Brian. It's not going to be super soon, but in the near oh, future, yeah. this year for sure, yes. we got a big thing planned for Civil Gore that I think you uh, you fans are going to really really love. But uh, yeah, that's, that's it's too early to tell right now. But uh, it's coming. Yeah, we're not, we're not sure of the time frame. It could be like in a month. Could be in two months. We don't know. But it's definitely coming soon. Yeah, so look forward to that. So, guys, we will be back here next week on our countdown to episode 100. We appreciate you listening. And remember, don't get into any strange pods with Jeff Goldblum. Yes, and stay out of the plasma pool. (laughs) 